And now to our first guest, one of Gough Whitlam's closest advisers in government, Jim Spiegelman, who served as Prime Minister Whitlam's principal private secretary, leaving just before the dismissal. He's now, of course, the chairman of the ABC, and I spoke to him a few moments ago from China, where he sits on the Court of Final Appeal in Hong Kong. Jim Spiegelman, thanks for joining the program tonight. Good evening, Emma. As someone who worked very closely with Gough Whitlam both before and during his time as Prime Minister, what will be your enduring memory of him? Well, his energy, his commitment and his humour, um, and, and his con uh, dedication to public service. There's been a lot said today about how much Gough Whitlam transformed Australia. What do you think he changed about the country? I have no doubt that the country was a more confident country as a result of the change, but uh, many of the uh, trends and policies that he brought to fruition had, in some respects, started before his election, not least in reaction to his role in opposition. Now, you're joining us from China, which is quite symbolic, given you accompanied Mr Whitlam yes. on his first trip there as Prime Minister. In fact, it was the first trip to Beijing by any Australian PM. What was the significance of that trip at that time? And we know he'd already been to China in 71. Well, he'd been there as uh, leader of the opposition and that was of considerable significance because he went before uh, there were, was any Western leader who was prepared to do it. He, by coincidence, he was there at the same time as Henry Kissinger was on his secret mission to negotiate the contact with uh, President Richard Nixon. So, uh, but he came before that so, and the Chinese remembered that and frankly many of them remember that to this day. However, the, uh, the trip as Prime Minister was of course a, a much bigger and uh, more significant affair and uh, established relationships uh, to which uh, the nation is uh, an inheritor and to its advantage since. In fact, Tony Abbott credits Gough Whitlam with shaping the modern Australia-China relationship. Is evidence of his influence still obvious there now? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, uh, it's not remembered that uh, the host of uh, the touring party when, when he was there as Prime Minister it was in fact Deng Xiaoping, who had only just recently, about a week I think, been released from house arrest. Um, and uh, the Gang of Four was actually still in control. Uh, so, and we met a number of them uh, during the official engagements then. But everyone knew that when Zhu Enlai brought Deng Xiaoping out of house arrest, that things were going to change. I don't think anyone realised the extent to which Deng Xiaoping would in fact change the nation. He started off by getting rid of the Gang of Four, but after that, uh, the policies he implemented are one of the uh, great transformations in world history. Another great trans... I don't think anyone knew that at the time. Well, well, also, the transformation within the Labor Party, embracing the Chinese like that, after the whole reds under the beds and attitude to communism in recent history, would have been quite remarkable. Well, it, the, the Cold War was well and truly still in existence at that time and the Labor Party had suffered considerably from its perceived association with uh, uh, the left and communists in particular and unquestionably there were elements in the Labor Party at that stage that had such an association. It was in fact one of uh, Whitlam's principal contributions to politics that he uh, smashed that relationship but nevertheless uh, felt that uh, the policy towards China had to go ahead irrespective of the fact that it was a communist nation. So that's Mr Whitlam on the international stage, but his achievements at home also had extraordinary impact on the nation. Large sections of Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane were unsewered before he came to power. We owe the existence of Medicare to Gough Whitlam, as well as Aboriginal land rights, which you mentioned. Is it fair to say that the benefits of some of these big ticket policies are only really being appreciated long after he left power? Well, some of them, yes. Others uh, have never been questioned. I mean, for example, the land rights uh, position 
Yes, he did uh, appoint the uh, commission of inquiry that came up with recommendations. But in fact, he lost office before they were implemented. It was the Fraser government that passed the legislation. So uh, there were things that he, uh, as it were, initiated that have come to fruition since. And uh, that indicates the significance of the change, the time for those sorts of things had come, to coin a phrase. <laughs> he, he was the first world leader to appoint a dedicated advisor for women's affairs. What can you recall yes. about how he arrived at that decision and, and how the news was received? Uh, it was very controversial at the time. It was uh, uh, a figure of fun in the tabloid press. In fact, the, the original idea came from Peter Walensky, who was then his principal private secretary, and uh, the late Peter Walensky. Uh, it, he was um, uh, in advance on many of these issues, including the feminist movement that was only just beginning at that time, uh, the, the second wave of feminism. and he. Uh, Okay, he didn't find any difficulty in convincing Whitlam, but uh, there was no doubt in the short term there was a political price paid for that. What role do you think Margaret Whitlam played in that policy and others? I, I don't actually recall a discussion in which Margaret was involved on that particular uh, matter, although I know that she got on well with Liz Reid, who was the uh, person appointed. Uh, after the event, but uh, Margaret was uh, an essential part of uh, uh, Whitlam's uh, uh, drive, energy, comfort. Uh, she was one of the few people who could tell him when he was talking nonsense or talking too long. And, uh, you know, the relationship was a very close personal relationship, but it had significant implications for the uh, way the policy development and also the whole style of the government. It was, a, it was a wonderful relationship. And it was really seen as a relationship of equals at a time when women weren't necessarily considered equal, particularly when the husband was of that stature. I think that's quite true. I have no doubt that there were uh, significant, intelligent and powerful uh, Prime Minister's wives in the past, but um, they weren't as public because of the times didn't encourage it. There was just so much that we can credit Gough Whitlam for, introducing no-fault divorce, bringing troops home from Vietnam, lowering the voting age, and he was the father, I guess, of the needs-based school funding system. Now, the scale and pace of the changes brought him criticism from his political foes. Do you think he tried to do too much too quickly? One of his defining characteristics was his determination to honour his promises. He used to refer to the uh, uh, party platform as the Old Testament and to the 1972 policy speech as the New Testament, and he regarded them both as biblical and of theological significance. He was determined to implement the lot. Uh, there was criticism at the time, one of the... Uh, uh, in terms of the capacity to afford all of those changes. Many of them didn't involve uh, significant expenditure, of course, but quite a number did. And there were issues about, uh, both at the time, but perhaps more so subsequently, about the capacity of the nation to afford that many changes involving expenditure at the same time. It was one of his characteristics. He uh, wanted to fulfil all of his promises. Perhaps the... Uh, in memory, perhaps the, the biggest political difficulty for the government was the fact that everyone associated with it acted on the basis that the 1972 election was the landslide we expected it to be, when in fact it was a very close election. Bob Hawke has revealed that he warned Mr Whitlam that his government would live or die on its economic performance and he offered to organise a weekly session for Gough Whitlam with an economist. That was an offer Whitlam rejected. In hindsight, was that a mistake? Well, I don't remember this. I'll take uh, uh, Bob Hawke at his word, but Whitlam had appointed some uh, personal economic advisers of the highest quality. He appointed Nugget Coombs, the, uh, then the former governor of the Reserve Bank, and uh, a, a very senior Commonwealth um, public servant before that in economic policy as his personal advisor. He was, of 
considerable significance in the government. Under him was the late Professor Fred Gruen, who was also brought in as an independent advisor in the department. Uh, he had sources of economic advice. They may not have been the same as Bob Hawke's, but they were independent and highly qualified. In those first two weeks of the Whitlam government, anyone in the vicinity of that duumvirate would have, I reckon, got whiplash between the two of them, Gough Whitlam and his deputy Lance Barnard, had 27 portfolios. As the 2IC yes. in Gough Whitlam's office, tell us about that Whitlam work ethic. Well, I had quite a number of portfolios. Peter Wilensky had a number of others to look after and uh, we acted as intermediaries with, uh, be, with the, between the departments and the shadow ministry, uh, the then shadow ministry, but about to become the real ministry. Um, it was a hectic time, but uh, um, a, a quite dramatic and uh, I don't uh, time, but I don't think any of the decisions taken during that period with the subject of future controversy. They were things that could be implemented quickly, and they all were, including, not least, the recognition of Red China, uh, the release of uh, uh, conscientious objectors uh, to conscription from prison, uh, matters of that character were all done quickly because they could be done by executive action without legislation or uh, appropriate of, appropriation of funds. I mean, I can remember one shadow minister wouldn't talk to the head of his department um, because uh, he was going to sack him anyway and uh, so I acted as an intermediary um, in a well it was it was interesting but uh, at times painful. Tim Spiegelman unfortunately we have to leave it there thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Thank you.